French-Canadian writer-artist Guy de Lille is no stranger to being a stranger. Over the course of four autobiographical travelogues set in Asia, one true life story of someone else's ordeal set around Chechnya, and one coming-of-age memoir set in his native Quebec City, over the course of these six books, he gives us a kaleidoscopic collage of outsiderness, strangeness, being alone or adrift, and the complex cultural values of independence and freedom. Guy de Lille is also the author of other works like The Absurd, Albert and the Others, and Aileen and the Others, as well as his humorous Guide to Neglectful Parenting series. But in this episode of For the Love of Comics, I want to specifically talk about Shenzhen, Pyongyang, Burma Chronicles, Jerusalem, Hostage, and Factory Summers. Each of these books is a separate individual portrait of the proverbial stranger in a strange land, but taken together, they also present a journey of an evolving and maturing artist and human being. So here's a quick look at six comics I really love, written and drawn by Guy de Lille. The first of these six major works by Guy de Lille is Shenzhen, published originally in French in 2000, but not available in English until 2006. Shenzhen, a travelogue from China, is Guy de Lille's autobiographical story of traveling to this city in southern China on a work assignment. He works with an animation studio that is partnering with one based in Shenzhen, and he has to go and live over there for a while and train the local animators. Done in a stark pencil crayon style, this isn't a color comic that may look sketchy to some people, but it works rather well to tell a slightly bleak and grey story. There are many things in society and culture, specifically of the place where he is located, that seem alien and almost incomprehensible to the French-Canadian Delisle. And his presentation is as much a look at his own confusion and his own perplexity as it is at the strangeness of the work and social environments that he faces. From anonymous hotel rooms and the difficulty of finding even the most basic of materials easily, a dentist's visit, meals with colleagues, translation and language problems, all of the usual suspects for this type of story do show Show up. But what makes it so charming as well as thought-provoking is the honesty with which Guy de Lille presents his view of things. The view of the author is always clearly expressed, but it's a view that's trapped in time. It's very much about that incident and that reaction at that time. The larger conclusions are left up to us, the reader, to stitch together. This is the first of Guy de Lille's explorations into alien culture, but he's very clear, or I think the storytelling is quite clear, that alien is only a relative term. This keeps the book from being a comedy about how strange life is in China. Very often, I could relate to or find more familiar the Chinese situation, which then makes it a comedy of a western fish out of water in a known Asian world. The humor and the alienation, the superiority and the inferiority could all be seen as relative, while at the same time having an undercurrent of larger questions, questions about authoritarianism and questions about independent opinion. What could maybe be problematic about such stories is that it paints all of a foreign culture or a foreign country with one brush, where I think Dilil does a terrific job with not just Shenzhen, but all of his books is clarify constantly that this is one singular experience based on one series of conversations and one series of anecdotes never making any claims to general sweeping statements, but still asking us to question what we are or are not comfortable with, what we find funny and what we find unusual and why. Guy de Lille's follow-up work, Pyongyang, came in 2003 in French, but in English in 2005. In fact, Drawn and Quartley, who are the publishers of all of these books, published Pyongyang as their first Guy de Lille book. And after its success, the next year, in 2006, brought out the English edition of Shenzhen. So although chronologically Shenzhen comes before Pyongyang, many people, like myself, read Pyongyang first. And like Shenzhen, Pyongyang is an excellent introduction to Guy de Lille. It features much of the strangeness and alienation and the absurd comedy that can come from that, the same ones that Shenzhen did. But where Shenzhen did present an individual critique or disagreement with the environment, Pyongyang, I think, takes it up another level. Guy de Lille's work over here seems a little bit more pointed, a little bit more critical, 
of the government, of the way that the people of North Korea are programmed and controlled almost. And although I wouldn't go so far as to call this angry, this is a far more biting, scathing and scathingly funny. It has a little bit more of an edge than Shenzhen. Shenzhen is a thoughtful work, but a lot of its introspection also comes from Guy Delisle's loneliness and isolation, being away from friends and loved ones in a foreign country. In Pyongyang, there seems to be a greater focus on the country itself. And we are presented with scene after scene, interaction after interaction that creates this fractured reality world, and especially at the time, offering a rare peek into a mysterious culture. In the years since Pyongyang, there has been a lot of of writing and presentation on North Korea, but I still find this book with its singular focus on the middle class, the everyday, and the structures that we create, not just in politics, but also in society, that kind of an almost grassroots look, one of the finest comics travelogues I've ever read. Shenzhen and Pyongyang can be taken together as companion pieces and reading them back to back in either order will create this almost dizzying feeling of not knowing completely the world that we live in, but having a slightly, slightly better idea of it now. Guy Delisle's next book, Burma Chronicles, came out in French in 2007 and shortly thereafter early 2008 in English, again from Drawn in Quarterly. After the success of Pyongyang, and I'm guessing that of Shenzhen being printed by Drawn and Quarterly, the gap between the French and the English editions seems to get shorter from now on. Burma Chronicles continues to chart the evolution of Guy Delisle's art and storytelling styles. Part of this change and evolution is also circumstantial. Whereas in Pyongyang and Shenzhen, Guy Delisle was traveling for his work, in Burma Chronicles, he's traveling for his partner's work. She works with uh, Medicine Sans Frontier and she's posted to Burma for a year. Guy Delisle accompanies her and takes care of their young son when she goes to work. The fact that his presence in Rangoon, the then capital of Burma, is not because of his work means that he isn't really interacting in the work environments that we have seen in previous books. He's no longer dealing with that bureaucracy, hierarchy. He doesn't have work companions. And instead, his experiences now take on those of a stay-at-home dad, although very much an alien outsider stay-at-home dad. Perhaps with the change that comes in fatherhood, being there with his family, and also being a person who's just trying to figure out what to do with the time in the day. He goes for walks, he goes to museums, but he always has a kid with him. This creates a kinder, gentler Guy de Lille than we have seen before. While there continue to be sharp and acute observations of the people and the structures around him, the humor also seems to be gentler. The people he meets are represented by a few more angles, perhaps because of the time he gets to spend with them, and the variety of experiences he has revealed to him perhaps more aspects of the society he's living in. Now, it must be said that in Shenzhen, he does make it clear that that's not his first time in China, and other cities in China, and particularly Hong Kong, were very different from Shenzhen, and he does try to make that distinction to avoid the appearance of stereotyping. And I think that variety of views and approaches blossoms in Burma Chronicle. But at the background of all of these books is still the question of the governments and the level of authority, the balance of the military and democracy in these various societies. But once again, not from the point of view of a journalist researching history deeply, but rather getting those pieces of history in very individual voices and points of views from people that he meets and encounters. There are bits of general history providing context to the reader in these books, but they have an extremely light touch and only seem to touch upon the things that become thematically important to the more individual and private moments that he focuses on. Jerusalem Chronicles from the Holy City was published in French in 2011 and just a few months later in early 2012 in English. At the time, this was Guy de Lille's biggest book, The Number of Pages, and once again tells the story of one year that he spent in a city where his wife, his partner, was working, this time with two children. If Shenzhen and Pyongyang can be put together as companion pieces, Burma Chronicles and Jerusalem can be put together as two larger 
other more mature, more gentle, and more complex, perhaps, pieces. This is not to say that Shenzhen and Pyongyang are not complex. As I said, Pyongyang is one of my favorite comics of all time, even surpassing the maturity of Delisle's later works, primarily because of the energy and the rawness that it seems to have, the craftsmanship of the cartooning and the questioning of the writing, both trying to come together to a point that is interesting and unique and honest. But there's no denying the growing smoothness of the stories and the art in Burma Chronicles and then Jerusalem. Many would consider Jerusalem his finest work, incorporating the most number of views and opinions and different locations, perhaps the most expansive and the most ambitious of his works. More than his other works, Jerusalem sees Guy de Lille having specific questions to ask. Although there are always questions that arise, why do you do things this way and what does this mean, Jerusalem seems to take advantage of the author's I am every man, I am ordinary and average in my knowledge. It takes that style to new heights. For people like me, this is one of the main attractions of Guy de Lille, someone who's not trying to lecture you, but who's really trying to learn things himself in a particular way that is very relatable to all of us. We understand having conversations over dinner. We understand having an argument at work and taking politics and social sociology and culture, these sort of large behemoths of concepts, taking that and filtering it down into those individual moments, I think highlights a complexity that those larger conversations tend to sand over. Jerusalem sees Guy de Lille investigate in that way his notions of the conflict in this region. Quite naturally, he does not end up taking any particular stance on that situation, rather illustrating for himself and for us how complex it is. And in retrospect, that allows us to read even his earlier works in a particular way, where this is the limit of my understanding. This is the limit of what I was able to communicate. It is by no means a representation of of everything there is, but this is the way a single person can maybe be affected by these situations. That seems to be the theme in all his works, and the mature, complex Jerusalem therefore comes across as a culmination of everything he's been working on. 2016 would see the publication of Hostage in French and in English in 2017. Although there's a five-year gap between Jerusalem and Hostage, there were other books in the Neglectful Parenting series, I believe, that were published in this period of time. Hostage was another thick tome from Guy de Lille, equivalent in size to Jerusalem. But Hostage also marked a departure for him. Whereas the first four books we looked at were travelogues of his own experiences, Hostage was some else's story. A story, in fact, that has obviously been haunting Guy de Lille for many years. Way back in Shenzhen, his first major work, he talks about reading about this MSF worker who had been kidnapped and held hostage for a period of time and wondering what he must have felt like being isolated, being alone. This is when he's all alone by himself in a hotel room and he's trying to figure out what connections human beings need. And obviously that story stuck with him for so long that almost two decades later, he made hostage on that man's experiences. Hostage is truly unlike anything we've seen from Delisle before. Although still cartoony in its approach to human figures, the style changes very much from the outright caricatures of his earlier books. And where those stories were about multiple encounters and incidents, Hostage is instead a skin-crawlingly claustrophobic and slowed-down narrative. By staying in one room, in one location, chained to one bed by keeping the camera fixed there as it were. Delil investigates all of the themes that ran through his other books in a microscopic fashion. Hostage is a tough book to read at times, not just because of the physical torture, but because of the mental anguish, the slow breakdown of the psyche, and the manner in which it's resisted or fought against. Even though it's not his story, Delil's skill at autobiography allows him to make us, the readers, inhabit the skin of our central hero of the person that we are with to the point where we may also feel the same swings and shifts in his sympathy with his captors because of small acts of humanity within a larger incomprehensible situation. Perhaps more so than in any work other than 
Pyongyang, there is the possibility of having villains in this story. And there's no doubt that actions that are being talked about here are quite reprehensible. At the same time, the focus on individual human beings who we get to know in great detail or who we never have any idea of, that focus on how much we know and how much we don't know, making a difference to how we experience life. Hostage now presents all of these things as a stark piece of theater rather than the lighthearted comedy that we have seen before. But the themes and the questions about human struggle and survival, acceptance and resistance, adaptation, all of these things are things that we have seen before, but echo in a completely unique and new way in Hostage. And finally, we have Factory Summers, published in French and in English in the same year, 2021. I've talked about Factory Summers before here on YouTube, most recently in my most memorable reads of 2022. So I'll direct you to that video for my main thoughts on this coming of age autobiography, a return to his own life after hostage that tells the story of Guy de Lille's summers spent in a factory while he was in high school. It's a summer job that he took and once he got into college, he left it. So a chapter that was both brief and endless in his life. But I would like to say one specific thing about Factory Summers. There is a character that he meets when he's a young uh, boy, an older boy who works at the same factory as a summer job. That boy has a leather jacket and a motorcycle, is very cool. It's someone that the young Guy de Lille really looks up to and the other people in the factory tolerate. That young man dies in a motorcycle accident and that's a small little moment in this book. At another moment in this book, a retired worker from the factory who had worked there all his life comes back for a visit and is celebrated with great pomp by the people who are still there. He does a little demonstration of putting a pipe away with such fluidity and adeptness that everyone is amazed by his technique. Between these two very different employees of the factory, we get a host of others, many of them lifetime blue collar workers, some of them summer jobbers who will become lifetime workers, and then Guy de Lille, someone who's going to get away from it, go to another world, enter into another life, and leave this way of life far behind. The way the world seems to by the end of this book, seems to be leaving this world behind. Factory Summers echoes with nostalgia, but also with the view of a grown-up looking back at times and looking at them for what they contained, things that were pleasant as well as not so pleasant. Honestly observing them as a part of the texture of life rather than giving judgment on them, looking at them and recording them with such elegance and beauty seems to be the one thing that has run through all of his works, from his earliest and most scathing, scratchy works to his more gentle outlook. They're still all very honest. They're all very expressive of the self. And by putting Factory Summers on top of this entire pile of books, it seems to be, it seems to be not a culmination, not a crystallization, but just another chapter in the way that Guy Delisle tells us stories about his life and through that, about life in general, about what we may all experience in small moments that come together to be what we think about as our worldview, as what we value, what angers us, what irritates us, what we accept but wish we didn't have to. All of these things being given to us with no lectures and with no hyperbole, but with empathy and gentleness, which still can make fun of things, which can still find some things to laugh at. Those are the things that make Guy de Lille one of my favorite writer artists in comics today. If you enjoyed this quick spotlight on Guy de Lille, check out my Creator Spotlights playlist over here. This has been For the Love of Comics. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you at the next video.